it's tough to get a, a chat client to rule them all, essentially. Like, yeah, that's the the desire, I, I suppose, from a chat ops platform or a DevOps platform like GitLab is you'd essentially be saying this is the one that rules them all. And that's just not the case. Like many people, some use Slack, some use Gitter, some use IRC still yet, you know, even, oh, yeah. you know, some use Matrix. So there's a lot of different blends out there and the UX and the UI and all of that. And even, I suppose, to the sake of Matrix, what it's trying to do is provide bridges and integrations, et cetera, natively to enable all these chat communities to connect. And that's maybe the bigger part of the story. Yeah, I mean, from the matrix side, that that is um, the goal that we're aiming for to basically get best of both worlds. That um, say that GitLab did have a, a chat client embedded in it, it wouldn't be the only way in which you can interact with chat ops functionality. You would also be able to come in via Slack or via Gitter or via Element as a nat- native matrix client. So I wouldn't totally rule out the idea of a kind of interoperable world of chat ops um, in the in the context um, of an app like GitLab. But I also completely understand why it isn't core relative to the the key of the product. But it's um, going to be really really exciting, obviously, to go and take and get it and natively properly merge it into the wider matrix network. <laughs> Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at Changelog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. Deciding on a cloud provider is hard enough. And figuring out pricing and projected costs, that should just be easy. And that's exactly why DigitalOcean has transparent and predictable pricing and also an awesome pricing calculator that not only makes it easy to figure out your cost per month, but it also compares that cost against AWS, Google Cloud, and also Azure. So head to digitalocean.com slash pricing slash calculator to play with the pricing calculator, and then head to do.co slash changelog to try DigitalOcean for free with a $100 credit. Again, digitalocean.com slash pricing slash calculator to play with the pricing calculator, and do.co slash changelog to get your $100 credit to play with. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Change Like a Podcast featuring the hackers, the leaders, and the innovators in the world of software. I'm Adam Stachowiak, Editor-in-Chief here at Changelog. On today's show, we're talking with Sitzer Branded, CEO of GitLab, and Matthew Hodgson, co-founder of Matrix, to discuss their acquisition of Gitter from GitLab. A little backstory to tee things up. In 2017, GitLab announced their acquisition of Gitter to help push their idea of chat ops in GitLab. And as it turns out, the GitLab team saw a different path for Gitter as a core part of Matrix rather than a non-core project at GitLab. And today, we talk through all the details with Matthew and Sid. So we're joined here by a couple of friends. This is like a three-way Git merge when you're bringing everybody together. We have Sid from (laughs) GitLab, we got Matthew from Matrix slash Element, and we're here to talk about another thing called Gitter. Guys, thanks for coming on the changelog. Thanks for having us. Well, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. So the big news, which we're here to discuss, is that Gitter is exiting GitLab and entering the Matrix. And Gitter was uh, its own independent thing at one point, and then GitLab acquired it back in 2017. Sid, cue that up when you acquired uh, Gitter and why, and then we'll talk about the transition over to Matrix. Gitter is this um, great service where if you have an open source project, it gives you kind of a room for everyone to hang out in. When we came across its path, it was growing, it was doing well, but there was no business model uh, behind it. So the more successful it was, the more uh, money it lost. Our mission is everyone can contribute. And we thought it was great that this thing enabled open source communities to become more active over time. And we thought that deserved a home and we, uh, we acquired it. Uh, we invested, we made it better, it grew. But long term, chat is not something that uh, GitLab is going to specialize in. It's, uh, we're trying to have a complete DevOps platform delivered as a single application. There's all kinds of things in there from, from monitoring all the way to managing from security all the way to planning, but chat is not one of it. So we looked for a better home, uh, a home uh, 
uh, of a company that was uh, specialized in chat, but also, uh, well, I think it's a big benefit. We find a home that is open source, open protocol, uh, all the things that uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, we hold uh, uh, near and dear. It's definitely a different kind of trait from a CEO, though, Sid. Not just so much your decision is alone, but I'm sure that inside of GitLab, the thought that that uh, Gitter doesn't fit long term with your vision, you know, not so much just keeping it or holding it. You know, hoarding might even be a better word to use. You know, one of your promises back to the community was to open source it, which you did, but then the desire, I suppose, to see it continue is is very admirable. Yeah, I, I think. I want to thank two people. First of all, Eric, uh, who for years, like kept growing Gitter many times by almost by himself, even though the rest of the company wasn't focused on it. And then I want to thank Eleron. Eleron does mergers and acquisitions at GitLab and uh, he's focused on acquiring companies. We just acquired two fuzzing companies not too long ago. But now he also shown that he can, when something doesn't make sense, he can find a great new home for it. So I'm, I'm very grateful to both. There was a time, Sid, where chat ops was like going to be the next big thing. And everybody was talking about how you were just going to tell a robot to deploy via your chat channel or you're going to, and those integrations exist on, on various platforms. Was that a, a concept that you were buying into and you think that it's, it, it doesn't actually work out in the long term? Or what are your thoughts around that like why is chat not part of a devops platform in your opinion that is a great question i don't get it on kind of visceral level like on an intuitive level i don't get it i thought we would have the great chat ops application by now i really studied this market um i think the reason is that currently if you want to do chat ops a lot of things don't work out of the box. Everyone has to set it up and then it works different for every project. So your chat up skills are not transferable between different projects. And if you look at a most significant companies, they have a ton of different projects. So chat ops is a feature of GitLab and it works the same way, whatever project you're in. However, it's not reached the popularity I expected. Um, and there's much more to it, but in short, Chat ops doesn't require us to run a chat client. Chat ops in GitLab works both with uh, Slack, it works with Mattermost, and I hope it soon works better with uh, Matrix as well. But it's not a reason for us to, um, to run our own chat client. I think chat clients are very different business. There's a lot more people that use chat than DevOps tools and UX and user experience is much more important. Uh, with, it's, it's important anyway, but with chat, it is extremely important. So it's a different ball game and a, a game we're not playing. It's tough to get a, a chat client to rule them all, essentially. Like you know, that's the, the desire, I, I suppose, from a chat ops platform or a DevOps platform like GitLab is you'd essentially be saying, this is the one that rules them all. And that's just not the case. Like many people, some use Slack, some use Gitter, some use IRC still yet, you know, even, oh, yeah. you know, some use Matrix. So there's a lot of different blends out there and the UX and the UI and all of that. And even, I suppose, to the sake of Matrix, what it's trying to do is provide bridges and integrations, et cetera, natively to enable all these chat communities to connect. And that's maybe the bigger part of the story. Yeah, I mean, from the matrix side, that, that is um, the goal that we're aiming for to basically get best of both worlds. That um, say that GitLab did have a, a chat client embedded in it, it wouldn't be the only way in which you can interact with chat ops functionality. You would also be able to come in via Slack or via Gitter or via Element as a nat native matrix client. So I wouldn't totally rule out the idea of a kind of interoperable world of chat ops um, in, the, in the context um, of an app like GitLab, but I also completely understand why it isn't core relative to the, the key of the product. But it's um, going to be really, really exciting, obviously, to go and take and get it and natively properly merge it into the wider matrix network. So we have this transition, a passing of the torch. Who called whom? How did this deal come together? It's always fun to know, like... What was the pitch? What was the idea? And who got it all started? I assume that Aleron reached out to Element. But uh, Matthew, what, what do you think? Yep, he did. He did indeed. I mean, we, we know Aleron well and have been um, 
uh, chatting to him. In fact, I met him in person at um, GWADAC, the GNOME developer conference a few years ago. I think I might have bumped into him at FOSDEM too. And we've been chatting on and off. And um, uh, yeah, he reached out, I guess, on behalf of GitLab um, a couple of months ago um, to explain the, the possibility here and see uh, wherefore we thought that there might be a match, given that... Um, no, whilst um, Git hasn't become core to GitLab, it absolutely can become core um, to the Matrix ecosystem. I mean, our plan is to go and make it the poster child of how you integrate an existing chat platform into the wider Matrix um, network. But um, it was a really good conversation. I think we're on the same page. And um, I, I know Sid and has helped us with advice on Matrix and growing Element as a company over the years. Um, so uh, honestly, we were very flattered um, to be asked if we could um, help out. But it really is a nice um, win-win, I think, on both sides. So I appreciate the way you say that, Matthew, and whoever's writing your blog post copy did a good job as well, talking about Gitter becoming a core part of Matrix rather than a non-core project at GitLab. And it seems like that's really the case where GitLab thought it was going to be core. Turns out that doesn't make sense long term. It can be core to Matrix and Element. And so this is just a much better long term fit. So there's the why. The how in terms of like the transition, because transitions are tricky. Uh, Acquisitions are tricky, even with existing communities. Every time I see an acquisition of a my favorite tool or project, I'm always like, oh no. Or sometimes I'm like, oh yeah, it kind of depends on who's acquiring and what I think about really the autonomy of that project. This is a case where we have a non-indie project going to uh, a new owner versus the initial when GitLab acquired it, went from like indie to non-indie in that regard. But we have the passing and the how is interesting from Matrix's perspective. So you mentioned it's going to become this native bridge Maybe tell us how it's going to work in the short term because Gitter is a standalone service and it's going to integrate with Matrix. But I thought there already were bridges to IRC and Slack and maybe even Gitter already. Yeah, so there already is a pretty basic bridge between Gitter and Matrix. I think it was the second one we ever built. The first one was, of course, IRC, but the second one was um, using the same code base but customizing it for Gitter. And the reason was that one of our developers on Bridges at the time uh, was very active in the NeoVim community. And NeoVim had ended up being split between IRC, Gitter, and Slack all at the same time. Mm. And so we experimented on the poor NeoVim community by going and bridging them um, from IRC to Gitter and also eventually from Slack uh, to Slack. And I think it's still running today. But the problem is that Gitter doesn't have any native concept of bridging. So we did it using the simplest, worst possible type of bridge, which we call bridge um, bot based bridging. So you literally have a bot called Matrix bot. Um, not very imaginatively, that connects in on the Gitter um, channel and it relays the messages to people on the Matrix side who could in turn be coming in via IRC or Slack or wherever. So the messages get across, but it looks really ugly. It's you know, horrible in that you don't get the correct user profile for who's speaking. Everything looks as if, as if it comes from Mr. Matrix bot. And perversely, as the years have gone by, because that was like four or five years ago now, um, more and more traffic has come over into Gitter from Matrix And to the extent that I'm guessing, probably about a sixth or a seventh of it today is probably natively coming in from Matrix. And all it needs is for one person to do something stupid and um, get the kind of anti-spam or the anti-abuse stuff and get it to kick in and the entire bot gets taken out. So ironically, we know Eric, um, also known as Mad Little Mods, who's been valiantly keeping Gitter um, uh, uh, growing for the last couple of years very well over the years because we have to keep pinging him and saying, hey, Eric, we just broke Gitter again. (laughs) We broke the Gitter bridge. Can you guys unblock us so we can keep bridging in the traffic? And he's been an absolute star. Um, We expected him to say, what are you guys doing? Injecting all of this traffic into our network with this horrible, ugly bridge. But instead... um, he has been uh, really, really supportive and nice um, about it. And um, it's honestly going to be very, very nice to take that bridge and take it out behind um, the bike shed and um, dispatch it and replace it with something much um, more sophisticated. So what we'll be doing is setting up a proper home server on Gitter.im um, and have it um, bridged directly into the core of Gitter. 
And we want that to be exposing the existing conversation history. And it will be the first ever bridge, I think, that we've run, at least on matrix.org, which goes and exposes existing conversations into matrix. And it will allow, um, the, uh, well, it will allow Gitter users to appear as native matrix users inside matrix and vice versa. So it really will be the holy grail, platonic ideal for how you would take an existing platform that previously didn't have bridges of any kind and then just make it interoperating with the wider network. And because we've got loads of um, developers already hanging out on Matrix, like the entire Mozilla community now is on Matrix, and we've got um, uh, the GNOME uh, folks use it, they have their own server, KDE has it and has its own server, um, bits of the Linux Foundation, I think, are coming on board as well. Um, it will be super nice to get all of the projects who hang out on GitHub and just be able to directly link them together and DM each other and generally be part of one happy family rather than the sort of balkanization and the solids that we see otherwise. Our friends at Pixie are solving some big problems for applications running on Kubernetes. Instantly troubleshoot your applications on Kubernetes with no instrumentation, debug with scripts, and everything lives inside Kubernetes. But don't take it from me, Kelsey Hightower is pretty bullish on what Pixie brings to the table. Kelsey, do me a favor and let our listeners know what problems Pixie solves for you. Yeah, I did this keynote at KubeCon where we talked about this path to serverless. And the whole serverless movement is really about making our applications simpler, removing the boilerplate, and pushing it down into the platform. Now, one of the most kind of prevalent platforms today is Kubernetes. It works on-prem, works on your laptop, works in the cloud, but it has this missing piece around data and observability. And this is where Pixie comes in to make that platform even better. So the more features we can get from our platform, things like instrumentation, ad hoc debugging, auto telemetry, I can keep all of that logic out of my code base and keep my app super simple. The simpler the app is, the easier it is to maintain. Well said, thanks Kelsey. Well, Pixie is in private beta right now, but I'm here to tell you that you're invited to their launch event on October 8th, along with Kelsey, where they'll announce and demo what they're doing with Pixie. Check this show notes for a link to the event and the repo on GitHub, or head to pixielabs.ai to learn more. Once again, pixielabs.ai. So with an open source project, it's always worth asking what exactly is being acquired. Surely the Gitter brand and IP and like what Gitter is. I assume there's some employees that are being transferred between organizations. Is that correct as well? You're getting a team? Yeah, we, we can't stress enough how essential Eric has been to the continued success of Gitter. Um, he uh, many times single-handedly uh, kept everything going. So he'll transfer... Uh, IP, but also like the, the, the infrastructure, the, the, the server, the backend, uh, the database. So all the history will be preserved and uh, Matthew might want to add, but uh, I think that those are the most important parts with Eric being uh, the, the most important thing that kept, was, kept Gitter going uh, through these years. Yeah, precisely. Um, so obviously the service itself will keep running. Um, the domain name and the branding and et cetera that comes over um, to us, but we're going to keep the service running um, as it is today. Um, Eric um, joins the Element team, um, starting off to focus on basically running this integration project to go and be this very, very transparent open source um, migration to go and um, get, get it into Matrix. In the longer term, it's kind of an interesting one because Gitter has a bunch of amazing features that Matrix doesn't have and Matrix has a bunch of features that Gitter doesn't have. And the we run the risk of spreading ourselves quite thinly if we end up having to support two big flagship clients. You know, it's going to be, we already support three separate code bases on Element Web, iOS, and Android. 
and Gitter today is three separate code bases on web, iOS, and Android. And suddenly having six different sort of flagship developer apps, which need to, or developer chat apps, which we need to look after, could be quite painful. So what we're committing to do is to keep Gitter running as it is today, at, at least as well as it has been running um, for the foreseeable will be, first of all, bridge it into Matrix, and then we shamelessly get the features that it has and implement them in Element 2. And assuming that we do that in the near future, and I hope that we will, as soon as we get to that point and get parity, then we would look at switching Gitter itself um, for a Gitter-branded version of Element. So all the URLs will still work, the app would still work, except in practice it would be the same code base as Element, and it goes and combines the two together. And it means that um, Gitter would get all of the um, nice stuff like end-to-end -end encryption and VoIP and read receipts and um, access to the whole matrix ecosystem. But on our side, we would finally have KTEC support for embedding LaTeX into rooms, which is a really nice feature um, on Gitter or the excellent um, offline, um, sorry, the excellent SEO um, static archives, which Gitter has. And the fact, no, I literally sat down uh, when doing the due diligence for this and benchmarked how rapidly Gitter launches to a live view of a chat room. And it was about 1.7 seconds to go from absolutely nothing, like mm, totally virgin browser, through to being in one of the Angular rooms that had like 25,000 people in it chatting away, which is incredible. Like that's faster than Discord, it's faster by a factor of 10 than Slack, and it's faster by a factor of about 20 than Element. So we basically want to get best of both worlds and then converge the two. I remember when we talked last, Matthew, one of the things we ended that show with, what was that episode, 384 of the change we talked, and near the end, one of the biggest questions we sort of ended on was this still question mark, and I suppose Gitter might be solving this for you, is a UI problem for Matrix. Maybe speak to that. Why the details here make sense, but why this acquisition? Why did you need to acquire uh, Gitter to to make this happen? The two code bases, you know, the overhead, you know, why was that the smarter move towards, I suppose, solving your UI problem? Honestly, we've been talking to Eric for two years, I would say, about getting Gitter natively into Matrix, and um, he was interested and was saying, "Hey, you know this." could be an interesting thing for us to do but then you know we've got our own priorities we're looking after our own users it's a bit of a big strategic decision and all the rest of it and I honestly think that um, if we had done the work ourselves and contributed it as an as a MR against um, Gitter um, it probably would have been merged and yeah Gitter could have natively come on board too but um, the the way in which the cards have fallen here is almost better in that we can do it pushing from both sides at the same time. And we can, as I say, use it as this poster child kind of flagship example of integrating an app into Matrix. And our hope is that the guys at Slack will sit there and say, oh, perhaps it isn't that hard. Perhaps we'll go and bridge in two or Mattermost or Rocket Chat or whoever it might happen to be. And I mean, the Rocket Chat guys, for instance, have been trying to do this for years since really early days. And they hired somebody, I think, twice now to work on Matrix integration. And the problem has been, in that instance, that we didn't have the bandwidth to support them from the Matrix side. Plus, it was pretty early. This was like three, four years ago, and it was too early, and it kind of fell apart, and they ended up implementing their own limited federation and that sort of thing. So I see this as an amazing opportunity to leverage at the risk of sounding like a nightmare CEO talk. It's a synergy mm, between oh no. the two um, the organizations. Synergy. There we go. Sid likes the synergy. Roger, bingo. <laughs> I, I, I think it's, look, it's overused word, but I, I think you very clearly articulated it. And if you look at, uh, I don't want to speak for Matthew, uh, but I think Gitter is a very easy on-ramp to chat. Like it's, it's the fastest way to get started uh, with, uh, it's going to be the fastest way to get started with Matrix. It's uh, less than two seconds. Um, it, it has 1.7 million users. And I, I think the people who are passionate about open source have a huge overlap with the people who are passionate about Matrix and a federated protocol that, that allows you um, to have a lot more control. And uh, I, I can see this, uh, see this growing both, both 
Kidder and and the Matrix, which is uh, which is exciting because look, we we want one one company to own all of email, and it would be strange for one company to all uh, own all of chat. And I think Matrix is solving that. I actually think synergy is an underused word. Oh no, unpopular opinion. <laughs> I mean, I really do. I think if you really understand the the definition of it, you know, taking many things and the thing that you create with those many things is greater than the things themselves. I think it really makes a lot of sense. And I think it's an underused word. And I don't think we should use it every day, but I think it's an under understood <laughs> and an underused word. So I'm going to back you up, Sid, and say I like that word. And that makes sense to me. And I, I think mostly when it when it's used in the Wall Street Journal, it's some company got pitched by an investment bank and they overpaid for something and the synergy means they're going to fire a whole bunch of people. Right. And I think none of these things are true. There was no investment bank involved. Um, frankly, I don't think Matrix overpaid. And I think that the investment is going to increase um, after this. So I think there's a very good case for synergy. And thanks for saying that. Yeah. You know, you too, Sid, as well. I can see that you have a, <clears throat> I suppose, a care. And I'm curious what the relationship after this might be. Sure, this is an acquisition, but this doesn't seem a, like a relationship where you just sort of like shake hands and just walk away. What What do you think GitLab will do around Gitter over the long term? Will you continue to promote what's happening here? What role do you see GitLab playing or the, I suppose, the marketing behemoth that you can be for Gitter and Matrix and this blossoming ecosystem of open source goodness and developer chat and all those fun things because you care about the community. So I'm imagining that you're not going to just walk away. What's going to happen from here for you? Yeah, um, I don't think the, uh, the acquisition by Matrix has any requirements for us to keep doing anything after. Uh, but uh, GitLab, the project is on uh, Gitter and we look forward to continuing that. And uh, we're, we're open to um, helping out our mission is everyone can contribute. So if there's stuff in GitLab that can be better, uh, we are, we're open to that discussion. And I've been a big fan of Matthew and uh, the, what he and his team uh, are doing. And uh, if, uh, if we can s support that either on a company level or on a personal level, I, I'd be happy to help. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, we'll be um, uh, adding GitLab um, uh, authentication integration into all of Elements, as, uh, as well as um, going and bringing the you know, every repository can be a chat room um, mentality from Gitter into the wider Matrix ecosystem. You know, as part of getting Elements to parity with Gitter, um, we need to have that sort of feature. So uh, I think there could definitely be the DevOps, ChatOps layer, um, even if it's driven mainly from the matrix side rather than the GitLab side. And perhaps we'll get to the point where it will be uh, an obvious, I'm not going to use the S word, an obvious um, integration between the two of some Synergistic, flavor. I'll say it for you. Ah. <laughs> Well, you know, one thing, Stop that, it, Adam. one thing to note here, I, I think, is something you're saying, too, is if we have some listeners that are on the engineering team at Slack or Discord or Mattermost or wherever, what you're saying is that part of the reason why this acquisition makes sense is because this can be, in your own words, the poster child to show how this could be done well. So this is sort of like saying, pay attention to what we're doing here because this could be in your future. Yep, and that is absolutely the business case, or the not really business case, the rationale, the justification on our side for doing this. It's to bootstrap ourselves out of the mess that we had before, where, as I said, people like Rocket Chat would try to do this themselves. We couldn't support them properly, and it was too early. Now it is the right time to do this, but to have the best chances of success, it's great to have both sides of the bridge wanting to build a bridge and having the sort of uh, alignment and enthusiasm to make it successful and then having shown everybody how we can build bridges like this it's a blueprint that other people can do without needing so much input from us or anything we will literally blog the hell out of this so that people can <laughs> go and see the steps needed to successfully pull this off and whatever nasty um Know, issues we come up with along the way. So things like importing old history on mass and whether you do that incrementally is a surprisingly tricky problem. You don't want to be in a world where every time somebody joins a room via matrix, it has to kind of scurry away and pull up all the Gitter history and load it in before you can talk or something like that. So the, the mechanics is surprisingly tricky to get right. And we just want this to be the, the flagship example of doing it. And 
the fact that both sides of the bridge end up under the same organization is just a really, really convenient way of making sure that's successful. What's up? I have good news for you. Google Open Source Live is happening and you are invited. Each month, Google Open Source experts are hosting events focused on different open source tech and areas of expertise. And each event includes multiple sessions with multiple speakers and a live Q&A. You can join the speakers and the MCs after the presentations are over for an after party on Google Meet. And this is an opportunity to connect with those speakers and other attendees. Some upcoming events to take note of. October 1st is Knative Day. November 5th is Go Day, and on November 12th, it is BazelCon 2020. Learn more and check this out at opensourcelive.withgoogle.com. Yes, you heard it right. That is opensourcelive.withgoogle.com. to an interesting place in the world of open source where we have companies that are built around open source projects acquiring open source projects from other companies who are built around open source projects. I don't think this acquisition is unprecedented, but it's definitely an instance in an emerging trend of kind of a new class of things, at least I believe it is. And there are other people who are going to be coming in the wake of this and maybe having similar scenarios with their businesses or their open source projects. I'm curious how much you guys are willing to share in the due diligence and the financials of like, what does an acquisition like this look like so that other people can have some sort of realm of possibilities? Like I wouldn't even know what order of magnitude we'd be talking about. We talked 1.7 million people on Gitter, small team. sounds like Eric is awesome. Uh, Probably a couple (laughs) other people playing support there, but uh, what all is involved in the due diligence? And then you mentioned you don't think that Matrix got... Uh, overpaid. If you're willing to share financials, we definitely listen to them. I'm uh, I'm okay with uh, sharing, but I want to leave it up to Matthew what what he wants to indicate and whatnot. And sorry for putting you on the spot there, Matthew. <laughs> no, no, that's quite all right. I think that um, from a financial perspective, is slightly missing the point on our side in terms of people are just going to get hung up on numbers and you think that makes in sense. some ways. And uh, I, I think as, yeah. as, as, as a, you're you're taking on a huge kind of additional burden now going from three clients to six clients and then having to reduce that again so i it's it's kind of the it's almost bootstrapping like get this in the hand get your get matrix in the hands of a whole new whole new audience and uh i think that's that's what this is about and i i agree the focus should be on that um Maybe what is might be interesting for the audience, if there's deal terms that we kind of negotiated back and forth on that you feel comfortable sharing, that might be interesting because it's like people always talk about acquisitions and negotiations, but they're always pretty vague. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, I think I think things like that are tricky. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting um, angle. Well, I'm worried that this is all going to suddenly go off into um, legal corporate development discussion <laughs> style things, which um, I guess is something that uh, we have to do on a regular basis for like funding rounds and M&A activity. I, think, I can imagine like the geek audience might flee at this point if we start talking about... You'd be surprised. About, you know, taking- humor us and we'll move on. We're, yeah. we're not going to hold your feet to the flame here, uh, Matthew, but humor us with something. Be, the reason why I ask well, is not I, I because I want to like peg a number and everyone's like, the acquisition was this. It's because like I'm inside the open source world. I'm also in the business world. I don't even know the order of magnitude of like what, like what is this kind of a process like? And I've never gone through a due diligence like you have. So any insight into that process, you don't have to share the numbers, but something that maybe we can provide some context or even just a challenge or a struggle that you went through in making this decision because both companies had to make a big decision here. I mean, I can tell the story um, from our side. And honestly, this was a very um, 
painless process indeed and like huge kudos to GitLab for being a very very transparent no BS um, outfit I think it probably helped that you know Aloran and Sid already and Eric for that matter so it's not like we're doing business with strangers and um, the due diligence process was uh, basically a bunch of shared Google Docs which looked very much to be the existing internal shared Google Docs, which um, GitLab had put together, and we were just invited straight into them and could scribble all over them. Had a couple of video calls to look over um, the sort of KPIs, the Grafana dashboard style view of where things were at and how traffic was shaping um, over the years and what the figures were, Um, but it was just very, very um, straightforward. In terms of the process to get authorization on the element side, Uh, We have a board on the element side, so the acquisition here, even though it's basically entirely for the matrix that ecosystems greater benefit, we've actually done the acquisition as element as the for-profit starter rather than the non-profit matrix.org foundation, because frankly, that's where the money is and it's where we have the infrastructure to um, support um, the legal process of doing an acquisition. So we went to our board and said, hey guys, bit of a crazy one, but this opportunity has come up. Um, we believe this could be incredibly positive for Matrix because it will demonstrate that um, you can link existing um, systems as a first-class native citizen into Matrix, which nobody has basically done before. All the other bridges are pushed from one side or the other side and nobody natively speaks them. Nobody has done an IRC network which has native matrix support. We've spoken about it with Freenode, but in the end, it's a lot of engineering to have happen. Whereas um, for something like Get It, it could be easy. And this will cement Matrix as the obvious open place for open source developers to openly collaborate with one another on an open standard in a very open way. And so our board said, yeah, sounds good. Um, Why not? Um, Then in terms of the actual legal process, um, it's been a little bit of backwards and forwards. I get the impression, I mean, we've had a, a bunch of... Um, distractions on my side. I think the GitLab has also been uh, busy doing um, uh, operational stuff. And so in the end, I think basically the respective lawyers have been going back and forth on it, which is always in some ways good because if you've got good lawyers on both sides, they go and figure the things out and the deal happens. On the minor side, if left to themselves, the lawyers can also go back and forth quite a lot. (laughs) And um, uh, I guess... It's useful to get the um, balance right in terms of getting to a sensible conclusion rapidly and not letting it um, drag on. Mm. I think we were impacted a bit by it being the summer um, and so lost a a bunch of time with me being out on holiday and Lars being out and that sort of thing. And in terms of juicy sticking points, I think the only thing that actually came up as a point of contention was whether we were going to... Um, take on liabilities for the business which existed prior um, to um, the acquisition uh, uh, itself going through. Um, So if something terrible had happened at some point historically on Gitter that comes to life, uh, comes to light um, subsequently, Mm. um, is it entirely our problem to deal with it? Or if it was due to a disaster that happened on GitLab's watch, is it GitLab's problem? And I mean, that's a Fair enough point for both sides to push back and forth on. And I think we got to a good place in the the end. But, you know, if that's the biggest problem to quibble over, then that's definitely a good deal um, and a good sort of process for myself. That seems to be a fairly normal point of contention, that particular piece. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of ironic because that point of contention, the biggest thing is the representation about the code base. Like, are we sure that all the open source licenses that are used in the product Mm. um, are adhered? to like if matrix would acquire the project from us and then they find this agpl library and that would that we wouldn't have adhered to the license now we would be liable to that so that that wasn't an, uh, an interesting one to oh. uh, to discuss so if you're moving a project between open source two open source companies and the biggest problem is open source license <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Well, that's a fitting detail. Thanks for sharing that, guys. What about from the back to the end user perspective here? If I'm a happy Gitter user today, maybe I'm on the Angular project and we're just happily using the chat service. What can I expect in the next six months, 12 months, three years? What's going to change? What's not going to change? 
I guess on our side, we really, really hope and promise that we won't screw it up, that we will keep it running at least as well as it is today. And in the immediate term, the main difference is going to be getting a mail shot saying, by the way, um, your chat history has moved over to Element. And if you're not comfortable with that, you have the right to um, delete it, which is you know, a requirement under GDPR and a perfectly reasonable thing that when somebody gets acquired, you have the option to opt out of the process, basically. And then um, as soon as we possibly can, and it really depends on how fast Eric and the bridge team here can get this bridge up and running, uh, we should start to see people flooding in natively from Matrix into the chat rooms rather than the super annoying Matrix bot channeling everybody and getting banned every two weeks. Instead, it will be proper native people coming in. And likewise, um, and we haven't decided this for sure yet, but it's possible that we might just expose all of Matrix into Git it. So rather than just joining chat rooms, which are backed by repositories on GitLab and GitHub, um, it, you could just use it as a free-form matrix client and talk to people anywhere else. So if you wanted to talk to Mozilla people, you could just go off and talk to the Firefox team directly. So that could be fun. Um, in, the, in the email where you ask people permission to transfer their data, are you going to work in a red pill, blue pill joke, or is, is that pushing it? <laughs> I think that might be pushing it, unfortunately, although it is slightly tempting. Unfortunately, uh, you know, when we began doing Matrix, it was already, I think, 15 years since the Matrix film came out. And we thought, mm. 15 years, wow. that's long enough that people are going to have started to forget about it. Now, here we are, it's 22 a cult years classic. later. Come on. It is, it is a cult classic, but it seems to be getting more and more cult by the minute. And particularly the red pill, blue pill thing seems to have taken on political overtones and all sorts oh, of true. weird um, about that? Uh, misadventures that we tend to steer the hell away from it. But it is tempting. <laughs> Perhaps we'll make an exception just this time. Oh. Oddly enough, I think the John Wick series actually brought new life to the Matrix series because everyone's just like, can I get some more Keanu Reeves kicking butt and then go back and watch the Matrix? I'm like, wow, this movie is actually pretty trippy and awesome. Yeah. That's just... My take I on think, the matter. I think one one interesting thing that that I would see is that it becomes easier to kind of migrate from the Gitter chat room to the rest of the company. And I think right now that's something where we at GitLab struggle. Like we have people in the Gitter chat room, but it's kind of hard to add them to all our kind of development channels. The channels that are a bit more internal because sometimes someone shares a customer name or something like that and that's a tough problem we're not solving it with this uh, with this move but i think making the outside of the company more permeable for uh contributors for for open source contributors for the wider community is something that matrix and element has has an opportunity to do like like nobody else and I think it's super important that it's not like you have your external chat room, you have your internal chat room, but imagine that you could still like DM the people inside the company. And I think that's the, the promise of Matrix, and that will be super important for the health of open source communities. Yeah, it's certainly something we've seen in terms of how Gitter has been used, that often it ends up being a slightly secondary community often to the primary one, because you get your Gitter room for free on your repository. And so there's always going to be people just turning up there, asking questions, and whether you like it or not, almost, you can have that community there, much to the frustration of the official project who uses Discord or whatever it might happen to be. So by having this permeable membrane around it and the ability to bridge through into and defragment the other conversations, whether they're having on, happening on IRC or Slack or Matrix itself, heaven forbid, um, is a real, real opportunity to basically bring the Git uh, audience more into the mainstream and just make it part of the overall party. I mean, it's like basically drifting back towards IRC in a world where IRC was one great big global network rather than fragmented, and everybody is roughly in the same ecosystem on the same page. So it's all born out of nostalgia for the 90s in the end. And this is a problem, though, with the... Uh I know I hear a lot of people say, this is my first time using Slack or this is my 11 Slack room. You kind of get the, the full gamut, but you got this, um, I guess, multiple opportunities, whether it's Mattermost or Rocket Chat, as you mentioned, or Gitter or you name it. There's a lot of different ecosystems and places to belong, I suppose. You know, And we here at Change will even have our own Slack and it's open. So 
we encourage our listeners to join that as well, just to have a place to go home, not so much to be the only place you hang out, but to be among the many. And I suppose the, the issue with that is this among, among the many is that you can kind of lock away conversations and you describe it as this fragmentation of dev chat. Can you kind of speak to that a little bit in terms of like quantify, I suppose, how ecosystems get locked away and then why the plan you have in place with Gitter solves that? Yeah, I mean, we see it everywhere, particularly in open source land, where open source is always a little bit disorganized, everybody pulling in different directions. And we've just seen so many projects um, fragment a million different ways. People going to Telegram, people going to Discord, people going keeping on IRC, people going to Slack. And previously, where everybody would have been on the same page, like you know, the Linux kernel mailing list, great example of the one place where you need to be for that community to track what's going on, and then the equivalent ones. Um, uh, instead, well, you have things like that NeoVim example I gave earlier, where they'd split three ways. Um, in Mozilla, they were split into the private internal Slack, so it wasn't even happening in the public domain anymore. And then on the IRC Mozilla network, as well as people also on Telegram, and it's just destroying the culture and the efficiency and the sort of cohesion of these projects. Um, it's almost a, a forking uh, mechanism like you would see and might be pretty problematic if your projects and you fork from under you, except it's even worse. It's your community forking its ability to talk to itself. It's almost um, balkanizing and breaking down. So... That is the risk. That's what we're trying to fix with um, Matrix and Getter being the only chat system that has ever focused purely on developers, which really is quite something. I'm amazed that nobody else mm -hmm. did that because uh, you know, IRC was never just for developers. It was kind of freeform geek chat on the mm -hmm. internet. Um, you know, Discord, obviously, for gamers, and they've kind of done this slightly half-assed um, trying to get open source people into it too. But get his only and you know, an element of Matrix, it was like IRC, just a general comms platform. Going and getting those guys from Getter into the existing developer morass and Matrix um, is, is just a no-brainer. When speaking to, I suppose, the the Gitter community as it speaks now, you mentioned let's not screw it up or something to that degree. Like that's the and then even to your board of directors, you'd you'd said like this is what we need to do. So obviously the pressure is on to do something. You'd mentioned not screwing it up or doing different things to integrate. And obviously we're talking about fragmentation here. One of the things uh, that was mentioned was essentially becoming, um, or sorry, that Git, Gitter would become a full-fledged uh, matrix client. Can you speak to sort of the direction beyond so the next six months or so? Like what's the long-term plan with, with Gitter and matrix? Well, as I say, we're going to take um, Gitter's specific features and try to get parity and element. So uh, the most important ones there is threading. So, for instance, I was up until God knows what hour last night getting threading working in Element so that we can go and bridge um, the threads through from Getter into Element because uh, and Matrix in general because it would be pretty sucky if we lose threading. Uh, we need to get the um, offline archives, um, the static archives I mentioned, which work so well. We need to get peaking working. And as it happens, I was also looking at the um, uh, improving and optimizing peaking in Matrix. At the moment, when you start peaking into a room, it basically transfers everything in terms of the um, who is present in that room to your server. And if and that could be like 30, 40, 50,000 people, and it's going to take 10 megabytes of JSON, and it's going to take ages to transfer, blah, blah, blah. Um, what if we could do that lazily to be more efficient? Um, we've talked about the LaTeX support. What other good things does Gitter have that we do not on the element side? Um, obviously, layering on top of GitLab and GitHub. Um, uh, and the single sign-on auth is lovely. I think they were the first people to do just um, OAuth to um, single sign-on. You just click the sign-in with GitLab or sign-in with GitHub, and you would just be teleported into the app. You don't need to pick a username or anything. And it's such an obvious thing to do, but we still don't have it on Element. And so we'll be adding that as well. And once we have those, and once the app launches at least as fast as Gitter, then that would be the point to say, hey, on a set, do we really need the Gitter code base running? And shall we just put a Gitter branded version of Element there instead? And I'm guessing that's going to be at least a year away, frankly, possibly mm -hmm. longer. We're not going to rush it. We will make sure in the meanwhile that the Gitter apps lives as well as it ever did. But also when it happens, 
gettable benefit from all of the nice stuff we have in Matrix, like encryption and um, the VoIP stuff, widgets. We've got brand new widgets as of last week, which are looking really sexy, allowing you to pin whatever iframes you like into your chat rooms and, and resize them now. Um, all of these nice things too. So I think it will end up feeling very much an upgrade from where um, things um, have been in terms of the features. And in case you're thinking that this is us being megalomaniacal on the Matrix side and assimilating Paul Gitter into the collective, um, it is worth noting that um, Eric and the Gitter folks had already come up with this as a plan before the acquisition, specifically for the mobile apps. So apparently the mobile apps as native iOS and Android have been a pain in the ass to maintain. Um, it, it's just too much stuff for the Gitter team to look after. They were falling behind. They didn't have the same features. And so there is already a GitLab bug out proposing to just deprecate them entirely in favor of just using a progressive web app instead, which would have been sad in terms of have, losing those native um, apps entirely. And one of the proposals that came up, again, prior to the acquisition on the um, bug, was, hang on a sec, why don't we just use um, Element or Riot, as it was then, in order to replace the native mobile apps? And everybody said, oh, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we use <laughs> Matrix for that? So it's not just us. It's get to, uh, themselves thinking, well, actually, do we really need uh, to have uh, a dedicated app for this? And it's shown that where the app is better, like Element is better in some places, then hopefully we can get best of both worlds. Yeah, that's a really good point because I think uh, what Jared and I are trying to key on when we ask you about the plan is essentially confidence, right? What, what confidence can you instill in, I suppose, existing Matrix lovers and those that are on Gitter now and I suppose the community at large, like what kind of confidence can you instill? And I suppose the plan coming from GitLab and Eric and team, you know, from that direction versus from you, you know, kind of, you know, propositioning this opportunity with them. It's like there is a belief in Matrix. There is a belief in this future. So uh, I think that's something to hold dear to as we, you know, begin to watch you down the next, you know, six months to a year, et cetera, is that confidence in the fact that, this was kind of planned already to some degree. It was from the GitLab side to make this happen. There was some desire on there. So that's the, the thing I think really matters is this confidence that can be instilled. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely confidence from the um, Gitter side. The Matrix um, can be the future of communication. And there's definitely confidence on our side that we'll keep Gitter running and that we can be a good custodian for it and indeed accelerate it and take it to the next plane of existence, if that doesn't sound too sinister. <laughs> We're definitely excited to see this transition take place. Guys, thanks so much for coming on the changelog and sharing the inside look at this, uh, this big adventure that Gitter is going on from GitLab into the Matrix. Sid, any final words from you or... Uh, something you'd like to pitch or promote as we close out the show? I think uh, it's essential to give people the option to host their own infrastructure. Even if not everyone does so, I think it's a great option. Uh, with GitLab, we provide the ability to self-manage your instance. Matrix is the prominent player to do that for chat. And uh, I think this is, uh, this is a great development for the world as data gets more important to everyone, more control over that data, more accountability is essential. And the world's moving that direction. This is a great example of that. Thanks so much uh, for diving into this. Really appreciate the questions. What up, listeners? Got a little bonus for you today. Just when you think it's over, we're going to give you a little bit more today. And here is an extended segment with just Matthew. Sid had a hard stop, so we asked Matthew to stick around for a few more minutes. And this is what happened. So since we last talked, Matthew, lots happened around Matrix. Uh, Riot is no more. There was a, a big raise of, of money at one point. You want to catch us up and tell us about the rename and some of the exciting things going on? Oh, wow. Cool. Was it before um, Automatic joined that we last spoke? I think it, it might have been. Yeah, so the Automatic thing was big uh, since we spoke, and then the rename was since we spoke as well. Oh, wow. Okay, so that must have been back in March, I guess, um, at the beginning of um, the end times, pandemic-wise, that we caught mm -hmm. up. And then um, it was in April that um, we announced that Automatic, the guys behind WordPress, um, had come on board Matrix with a strategic investment in Element, the for-profit that we used to keep the lights on for Matrix development and hiring the core Matrix team. 
And so that was really exciting. They um, uh, put um, just under $5 million into funding Matrix um, with the hope of basically building opportunity both for the WordPress ecosystem um, and likewise uh, in Matrix supporting WordPress. Now, since then, things haven't moved quite as fast as I would hope, which is entirely my fault and our fault on the element side um, for going and hooking up the WordPress world with Matrix. But the intention is still very much to get um, better integration for Matrix within WordPress and vice versa. And occasionally I have some really, really nice people at Automatic pinging me saying, hey, so, you know, that cool where we're going to be working on those integrations <laughs> um, please please can we like have it and um, so we've been running late on sorting that out but um, the automatic folks have been lovely to work with and incredibly helpful um, strategically in terms of helping advise us on growing element in fact very similar um, relationship to the one we have with said in terms of providing mentorship of how you build a massive multi-billion dollar open source company in a sustainable and ethical manner rather than the sort of traditional um, capitalist approach. And um, so Matt Mullenweg had already been supporting Matrix for many years um, as a donor um, on Patreon. Um, he was one of our sort of secret thousands of dollars a month um, supporters um, for like two years or so. So he obviously believed in what we were doing. And I occasionally ping him and sink. And then uh, he said, well, hey guys, but no, is there a way I can actually support more concretely and get involved and drive the um, overlap between the two companies? And um, as I say, it's been good and was very helpful and basically gives us a um, safety net in terms of financing through the pandemic and uh, whatever uncertainty lies beyond, whilst also going and finding useful parallels between the two, uh, two projects. I can't really think of any other companies other than Automatic and GitLab who have sort of used the same model here of taking an open source project and sustainably providing services and support around it for a larger ecosystem. I mean, there's obviously lots of open source companies out there, but once you have an ecosystem like the WordPress one, or for that matter, you know, the GitLab environment, yeah, um, it's fun to be able to learn from these guys. And they're having massive success on both fronts. It's really fun to watch. Yeah. No, it's very reassuring that it is possible to do this without selling out and you know, waking up one morning and discovering you've become Facebook or something. Hopefully, Sid and Matt aren't going to fall to the dark side <laughs> after I've said this, but um, so far it's, it's looking like it's possible to be good, uh, a good human being as well as have a successful business in open source. Not that it's easy, right. but at least there's a precedent. It's not easy, but possible. Yep. But back to that confidence that I was suggesting on the show, like that's what you get though. When you, when you work with organizations that, that don't make you think or make the audience or the user or whomever, you know, whatever, uh, now you want to put in there, think that you're going to sell out. I think that's the key there is like you matrix to me, given whom you work with and what I've seen from you so far, Matthew and the rest of your team doesn't make me ever think that you're going to be like sell out. Like you had, you're in it to win it, as they say. Yeah, well, I, I hope so. I mean, we spent uh, ages on the open governance for the Matrix Foundation to basically try to legally create a safety net or a kind of um, protection mechanism to make sure that even if we did go evil and sell out, you know, who knows what happens that we get acquired by some obnoxious company, perhaps, or uh, I know people just, the, the world economy completely collapses and we frantically start trying to think of ways to avoid having to downsize the company or keep the project. So, but there are all sorts of mm -hmm. worst case scenarios where things could go wrong. And so to try to force ourselves to do the right thing, we basically built it into the Articles of Association of the foundation that bad stuff like that will at least um, not impact Matrix and the Matrix as a protocol would be protected from it. But these things are hard. I mean, you look at dramas with DRM at the W3C or other um, places where kind of standards, neutral standards bodies have got onto rocky waters or whatever the expression is. Um, troubled waters. Troubled yeah. waters. Mm -hmm. 
um, or they've got onto the rocks <laughs> there you go. in terms of um, uh, being in a sticky situation. Uh, I, I, I think there's risk of us ending up with similar problems in future, particularly around um, legality of end-to-end encryption, um, data uh, ownership, the fact that data gets replicated around Matrix could be a fun one. Abuse in Matrix, the fact that bad guys use it as well as good guys for your definition of good and yeah. bad. Lots and lots of things which could go wrong. You know, what's interesting about that I didn't consider really is that uh, only until recently was it just a hypothetical that the world economy, world economy would, would collapse. Like only recently did it come to sort of full fruition that it could possibly be something that happens. Whereas before we would just say it kind of tongue in cheek, like, ah, ha, ha. like if that would ever happen, like now it seems like it's, it's a possibility far more than it ever had been in my life before. And to have those kinds of yep. protections and protocols and I suppose thoughtfulness to organization and governance, whereas before it was just like, oh, that's, we should do that. Now it's like, no, we need to do that because if the world economy, like, geez, can I say that word or not? World economy wow. collapses as Monday and my tongue's all tied up. If it ever did happen, like, and all this history and all this worth inside of, you know, you know, in terms of history, I suppose, you know, that you could search through was available to everybody or the bad guys, you know, not the good guys. Could be a, a bad world up there for developers in the future or for all. Yep, I think it's why it's important um, to provide a mechanism for folks to communicate, which doesn't put all your yeah. eggs in one basket. You know, even if the element team collapsed tomorrow, um, even if the Matrix Foundation collapsed tomorrow, at least the network and the tech is out there that other people can keep it running and keep it going, just That's like right. the web would limp along, even if um, you know, the W3C collapsed or even if uh, Mozilla and Google went bankrupt the next day. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of trying to engineer for uh, Armageddon scenarios is a good thing. Mm. <laughs> Well, last time we talked to you, and Adam brought this up on the main show, is we talked about some of the UX uh, problems that you're trying to solve, and like the with mm-hmm. with Riot, the client, and the UI and the UX of that experience. And one of the first things that you come across with any product or service is the name of the thing. And so Riot itself, it's funny. Like if you go back to 2020 and say like, what were the words of the year? I think Riot would be one of those words along COVID and quarantine and justice and these words, right? Protest. But Riot would be one of them, and it uh, seems like you jumped shipped on that particular term like at an opportune time, but you said, we're not Riot anymore. Historically, I've always thought Riot was, I hadn't had real-life experience with too much rioting. Um, there's now rioting going on in the United States and elsewhere around the world, and you know it's got a negative connotation. I always thought of a riot was like a good time, like, hey, it was a riot. You know, like, hey, it was a riot, it was a blast. Um, but you just I'm glad somebody that's thinks how that I use that's how I used to think <laughs> Well, you're literally the first person who has ever admitted to thinking of Riot as in a well, hey, there was a man, band called Riot, was Riot back or, in our day, Jared. I'm sure you can recall. And there was a song, Zoot yeah, Suit Riot. Riot. Remember that one? And that was a fun it song. Was. So I yeah. don't know. I had a positive connotation for a time. I mean, I, I remember uh, learning about the LA riots. I was alive during the LA riots back in the early nineties, but I wasn't like of age where I, I pay attention right. to you know events. So it was always a very abstract term, and I just thought it was like a blast or a, things were crazy. But it's much more concrete than that now, and now you're no longer associated with that word. So tell us about that switch. So honestly, the switch was independent of the misadventures and dramas of 2020. Yeah. Um, it's something that was many years um, coming. We actually put the word element in 2018 to replace it. Um, the reason for this was that a certain large company, which includes Riot in its game, um, went and posed some fairly big legal That's problems scary. for us when we were trying to trademark the word Riot. In fact, not even Riot, it was trying to trademark Riot.im um, just so that we could have a mechanism to protect um, from abusive forks. Like if somebody went and fought Riot and called it Riot, but better or more secure, and it had malware in it, then it's really useful to be able to go to Google and Apple and say, hey guys, by the way, these guys are ripping us off and it's malware, please get rid of it. You can do it anyway, but it's even stronger if you can say, look, they're infringing on our trademark. Um, So we filed for trademarks for it and... 
um, triggered the legal beast of a certain multi-billion dollar company who have a lot more lawyers than we do. And also, frankly, more people were seeing the negative sense of right than the, hey, I'm a right at the party right. kind of uh, mentality. Um, we also had the comedy problem that a lot of our um, traction at the moment is in the public sector. Um, for instance, um, Texas's Department of Public Safety um, uses Matrix for all of its um, public safety um, uh, sort of uh, work, which is a bit awkward if you ask everybody to go and install an app called Riot whilst you're dealing with some kind of public safety right. event. Um, and we were also working a lot with France at the time, and there was one memorable meeting where we were uh, having a very serious pitch to the Ministry of Digital about getting Matrix on board, talking about riots. And meanwhile, you could literally hear the riot in the street outside the ministry. Um, so uh, basically, the connotations were getting worse and worse and worse. There was also the problem, though, that we had three different brands flying around. We got Riot for the app. We had New Vector as the company, and we had Modular as our hosting service, which in the early days of Matrix made a lot of sense because we really wanted to make it clear that there were roles for different people to play. You can have multiple service providers. You can have multiple companies. You can have multiple clients. And so we deliberately gave them different names to kind of trigger people's uh, sort of get people's juices flowing and realize that they too could launch a matrix hosting service um, and that it would be available to people on Riot, but it would compete with Modular or whatever. And the good news is that that worked and people started to fill in the holes of the ecosystem with their own offerings. And nowadays there are lots of different people providing matrix hosting and there are hundreds of matrix clients and there are lots of companies building on the protocol. But um, the minus side is that it was getting really confusing for our users, particularly on things like fundraising. You go and talk to an investor and say, well, we've got all these random different brands. Yeah. And let me draw you a diagram to try to explain how modular relates to Matrix, relates to Element, relates to New Vector, blah, 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 blah. And um, we wanted to fix that. So we just called everything Element. Matrix obviously is sacrosanct and um, is still its own independent, neutral, open source project but on the corporate for-profit side we just renamed the company element we renamed the app element and we renamed modular as element matrix services which is basically element two so i think it's good overall elements a much um, more neutral um, name hopefully it's still quite memorable you are literally an element in a matrix and all the maths geeks will eventually groan as they realize <laughs> that we went from a matrix made up of vectors, which is now made up of elements, which is where we're going. Oh, boy. Oh, boy, indeed. Yeah. Well, one thing is for sure is it does take good naming. And that's something that I think we've somewhat done well around here, Jared. I don't know. Change all plus plus. There's some good names mm. you've had around here. And it does take a good cohesive, especially when you talk about multiple brands, you know, the company, the client the protocol, you know, et cetera. And so as you start to go into that, the layers need, do need to have cohesion and naming can provide that, that graph essentially to, to, to understand what everything is. I can only imagine how embarrassed you might've been to be telling people in France to install this riot client while things were happening to, to kind of trigger you to want to change the name. Yeah. Um, as I say, it's, um, it wasn't just that aspect of it, but it was definitely a synergy of different things. We were going to... Oh, I used the S word. Oh, Adam um, likes uh, it. Say uh, it more, please. <laughs> <laughs> we were going to... Synergy. Synergy. <laughs> we were going to do it back in 2019 when we relaunched um, Riot Web, as it was at the time, with an entirely new professionally designed skin. And we hired um, the guy who designed Unity uh, for Ubuntu, um, or led mm. the team there. It was just after Unity got canned and the canonical London office um, has a lot of people released. And so we worked with him to come up with the new design and it was head and shoulders above what we had before. And we thought, wow, you know, this is suddenly going to start feeling like a proper app. Why don't we also fix the name at the same time? And we chose not to in the end because we honestly didn't want to undermine the redesign by also changing the name. Because if people didn't like the name, it might uh, unnecessarily kind of undermine the rebrand. So we deliberately kept it where it was and then pushed it back another year and a bit until the time was opportune. 
to get Element sorted um, as a name. But um, it's only been two months now. Um, I, I'd say it hasn't had massive positive impact on uh, like uptake. It hasn't had massive negative impact either. It's been kind of neutral, and people uh, people on Hacker News seem to dislike it because it's too bland. There are people who think that we've done it to be politically correct, which isn't particularly accurate. I mean, as mm -hmm. I said, it's a confluence of many factors. Um, and uh, I think we'll see that people grow to love it. Although I do still find myself calling Riot Riot, which is really annoying. Yeah. I need to stop doing that. Old habits die hard. Naming is hard. It's got a couple things going for it. It's easy to say. It's easy to spell. And like you said, it's relatively a neutral thing. There's not much connotation one way or the other. Uh, slightly, uh, slightly bland, I guess, if you had to give a criticism. But it is what it is. And uh, definitely a hard transition. And given your accent, it sounds cool. It does sound cool <laughs> when you say it. It doesn't sound cool when I say it, but when you say it, Element, it sounds cool. It's like, when you say it, it's cool, <laughs> but not what me or Jared said. <laughs> if you say so. <laughs> say it one more time for us. Element. <laughs> See how cool that was? See? That's very cool. Although, if I, the, the, the irony is if I want to make it sound cool, I'm going to kind of go into, in a world, <laughs> and then do a Mr. Voice right. in a really bad American cinema. There was a chat client connected to all chat clients around the world. Its name was Element. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> shivers. I got shivers there. I'm digging I'm, it. I'm going to go see that okay, movie. I like it more now. Yeah, that's actually great. You should actually have a, when you click on the name in the, on the web page, you should have you say it aloud in the browser. Because people wow. love when their browser auto plays audio. You know? Yeah, they, they do, it. don't they? Yeah. yeah. No, I, we'll I love probably it. Have to, At night, too. Yeah, we need to work around um, some of the minor browser restrictions to make that happen. But hey, I'm sure that's oh, yeah. something we can do with service workers or. No. Uh, you guys have the technical expertise. I know you put like VR and Matrix and stuff, so I think you can get an audio element to play when you click on a button on a web page. That's just my take. Matthew, we know you're super busy. We appreciate you hanging out a little bit longer with us and chatting, but we'll let you go. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure to sing and catch up again. Hopefully, we'll have some interesting news in the future to talk about, too. Absolutely. That's it for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this extended episode here at the end with Matthew. That's cool to do that kind of stuff, and we appreciate doing that as well. Special thanks to the many listeners out there who share their feedback via that form about us sharing more extended content and, more importantly, not paywalling it behind Changelaw++. We don't like paywalls. We don't plan to do paywalls. We love you all. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be doing more of this as it makes sense. If you want to share your feedback, check the show notes for a link. And as you know, you can drop a comment on this episode for Matthew and Sid to read. Head to changelaw.com slash 414. This is episode 414. Open your show notes and click discuss on Changelaw News. We'd love to hear from you. Huge thanks to our partners who get it, Fastly, Linode, and Rollbar. Also, thanks to Breakmaster Cylinder for making all our awesome beats. And last but not least, directly support us by joining Changelaw++. Head to changelaw.com slash plus plus to learn more and join. Thanks again for tuning in. That's it for this week. We'll see you next week.